and produce basically a program, something that's in I.O. And the program will read from standard input and write standard output. It'll read JSON and write JSON. So what can you use to JSON filter on? Well, basically you can use it on any function uh, in the pandoc types, really. So a pandoc to pandoc, block to block, inline to inline, it'll just promote that to a program. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, here's an example using our all, all caps. So we import our module, which defines all caps. Remember, that was a function inline to inline. And then our whole program is main equals to JSON filter all caps. And that program will read JSON from uh, standard input of the sort that's produced by Pandoc. It'll convert all the strings to capitals and then write JSON to output. And so you can use it as a filter. Um, here's a slightly more complicated example. So um, this one will take all the emphasized text in your document and instead of having it italics, instead of having an emphasis, we'll make it all caps, okay? Just regular text with all caps. So, you know, if you think about it, an emphasis, um, the, the emph um, inline is, uh, it, it looks like this, you've got emph, and then you've got a list of inlines, right? So what we want to do is we want to get rid of the emph part and just have the list of inlines, but we want to capitalize all of those, all the strings in those. Remember, they could be nested very deep in there. So we're going to need a function that goes from an inline, such as an m, to a list of inlines. And to JSON filter knows how to deal with those by just concatenating. Okay. Which so, is the difference between yeah. this walk and just map? Because it, as, as right. I understand, xs is just a list of inlines, and yeah. why do we need walk? Okay. All caps is just in line to in line. It's a great question. I mean, map has the right sort of uh, type for that, but what map will do is it will, so say you've got a list of inlines. If one of those inlines, um, it, it's, going to, it's going to apply uh, the function to all those inlines, but what it won't do is go inside those inlines and apply the function to things that are nested from Oh, so what traverses this? Yeah, so it traverses everything. So, right, um, if you've got... So you, your, your list of inlines might have, say, a strong emphasis with an emphasis inside it, and map wouldn't get the emphasis inside it. Mm -hmm. So that's why you use walk. Yeah. So, so that's the whole program. It's, it's very simple. Um, if we find an emp, we walk all caps on the contents, and that gives us a list of inline. Otherwise, we just get a list with the thing we had, because we don't want to mess with it. And then we just say to JSON filter that function. And we get a program um, that you can use with the filter uh, option in Panda. Um, actually, maybe we should try it. Um, so, let's see. Yeah, I've got emph that's emph to caps. Yeah, so pandoc filter emph to caps are there. And, you know, we'll put one inside. Uh, uh, we'll put one inside a link too, just so you can see how it works in the nested case. And you see it made it into all caps. Yeah. yeah. How did, if you go back to the code, uh, I missed something. How did you transform the inline to a list of inlines to pandoc to pandoc if it's not? Like, I thought it had to be inline to just inline. Right, right. right. So if you, if you go back to, um, if, we, if we look at the, uh, <coughs> Let's see, what did I want? I wanted, uh, yeah, block. So, um, no, no, I didn't. I wanted uh, JSON. Yeah. Um, so here's the type class uh, to JSON filter. And um, you see I've got an instance for um, a to uh, list A. And what that instance does, it just applies the transformation to each item in the list and then concatenates the results. Because that's a very common pattern to need to use. Oops. Okay, um, so any questions on that?
Now, um, sometimes when you write a filter, you're going to want the uh, behavior of the filter to depend on what your output format is. And that's especially the case when uh, you want to do something that isn't supported natively by Pandoc. Um, so you, you, know, you really care about having something special happen in DocBook. Um, and so, you, so if the output format is DocBook, you want to put some raw DocBook code in for a certain thing, say. Um, when you use the filter option, it will, when it, when it runs this little program, the filter, it will pass the name of the output format as the first argument. So you can make the filter's behavior uh, conditional on the output format. All you have to do is use a function whose first argument is maybe format. So here's an example of that. This one will make emphasis into small caps in LaTeX or HTML, otherwise all caps as before. And so uh, what we do is we say, um, so it's the same as before, if we got a maybe format as our first parameter, and that will be nothing if, if uh, no argument is passed to the filter, but uh, Pandoc will pass it the output format. So if you use it with Pandoc-filter, uh, you'll get it. So just format. If the format is HTML or LaTeX, then um, small caps. Otherwise, do what we did before. So let's try that. Uh, oops. OK. Empty caps 2. So here's an example with uh, HTML. Um, you see it does small caps, but if we want to do it to, say, uh, a man page, uh, put some input in, then um, it just does regular caps because we don't know how to do small caps. There probably is a way. All right, so um, that's the demonstration. And um, because this is a you know, a hackathon and a, and a workshop and a class and all that stuff, I, I wrote up a sheet of exercises that um, you can work on at your, at your leisure, basically. Um, so this has, on one side, uh, why don't you pass those back? On one side, it's got the code samples of the filters that I just showed you, so you can refer back to them. And on the other side, it just has a bunch of exercises of Filters you could try to write, basically, r roughly from easy to hard. Um, if you want to practice uh, writing Pandoc filters, and uh, I'm sure we can all think of things that might be useful to write filters for. So uh, particularly if you're kind of a beginner Haskell coder, you might want to just use these as exercises. Um, otherwise, they're a good way to kind of get familiar with the Pandoc API and use it. So that's about all I've got. Um, and now I'll just open it up for any questions you might have. Yeah? Um, what you were doing with MathJax earlier, is there a way to configure math, the MathJax option to pull from a local JavaScript MathJax? Yeah. Um, the problem isn't the JavaScript so much. That, well, I'd I, I like to think there is a way to do that, but I'm, I'm not quite positive. Um, the, my memory is that the MathJax uh, script loads, dynamically loads a bunch of resources, and including a whole bunch of fonts. And so it's tough to, to get all that local, but I'm, I'm sure it's possible. Oh, oh yeah, actually, it's, it, it's, it's not hard at all, actually. Um, I was thinking of something different. All you have to do is get the MathJax, whole MathJax directory somewhere under, uh, under your, um, um, wh where you want to look at the thing, and then you, uh, you can pass in a variable that specifies the URL where Pandoc will be expecting MathJax to be. Okay, so, so the README will have, uh, the Pandoc README has a list of these special variables, or you can just look directly at the HTML template. There's a variable called something like MathJax URL. So if you put MathJax in the MathJax directory, you can just say MathJax URL is MathJax, and then it should work locally. What's difficult that I was getting confused with is um, Pandoc has a self-contained option. And what the self-contained option tries to do is it tries to basically download everything that's referred to on the net and include it directly in your document using uh, data URLs. 
Um, that's how I did the slideshow, by the way. I'm not connected to the net. Um, so I, I just did self-contained and it downloaded everything it needed for uh, uh, Reveal.js slideshow and just stuck it right in my document so it's totally self-contained. And that's what doesn't work yet with MathJax. And it's because a lot of the resources get loaded dynamically and so Pandoc would really have to basically run the JavaScript somehow and figure out what it needs to get and uh, that's, that's a little beyond me. But yeah, easy to do that. You, you can also produce MathML, which Firefox will show. So that's another way to do it if you want to do it locally. Yes? At one point you said that um, uh, Pandoc is using strings instead of text. Yeah. And strings are not as efficient as text. Is yeah. There, what's the reason behind that? Um, yeah, the reason is that uh, when I started Pandoc, there wasn't text. There wasn't a text library. Okay. Um, I think byte string barely existed at that point. Um, so really there was no good alternative at the time. If I were starting now, I would use text. And I think that at some point I'd like to refactor everything using text. It's just that it's a lot of code to refactor. Now fortunately with Haskell, <coughs> you know, it's, the compiler will kind of tell you what you need to do in refactoring. You just change the type of text and then the compiler will give you errors and you just look at those errors and fix everything. And once you've done that, you probably will have um, successfully refactored it. So it's, it's just a tedious job. It's not a particularly difficult job in some sense. Okay, it sounds like the text library is just inherently more performant. It is. It's, it's faster and, you know, because a string is just a linked list of characters. And it takes up a lot of space. Um, text library is much more compressed memory-wise. Um, so I actually wrote another um, markdown parser uh, that uses text, it uses sequences, and actually uses better parsing algorithms. But it's quite a bit faster than Pandoc, uses a lot less memory. So I think moving to text would help quite a bit. It's something that I mean to do, but it's, it's just kind of a tedious job. Is, is Pandoc slow enough that it, it matters on real documents? Uh, not for doing this kind of thing, but if you wanted to use it as your markdown converter for you know, github.com or something, that would be a huge issue, right? Because uh, if you're serving up millions of pages, yeah. you need to be fast. But for, for, for your own document, I mean, it's, it's, it's fast enough, yeah. I'd still like to make it. Yeah. Do you know of any like industry use cases where that kind of scale would use Pandoc? Uh, I don't. Um, you know, of course, I don't know everyone who's using Pandoc. So, and if it's GitHub burns yeah, the CPU exactly. second every time somebody updates their readme, really, you know, so what? Um, <laughs> well, they have millions and millions of pages. Um, they they actually went uh, went to a lot of effort to write a incredibly fast uh, C markdown parser. Uh, which unfortunately also has a lot of bugs, but um, but for them it was very important to make it extremely fast. So I think for that kind of use, on that kind of scale, using Pandoc probably isn't what you want. The rest of your stuff's in Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's yeah. the problem. Uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but most of the readers and writers that are available, uh, were they written by you or community? Most were by me, but there, there are definitely a number that are by uh, other people who contributed. One of the greatest ones, I think, was the org mode writer. This guy wrote it, and he said, well, I've never done any Haskell before. I just looked at one of the other writers and just sort of uh, went ahead. And uh, he managed to write a working writer. And of course, that's one of the great things about Haskell is if it compiles, you know, you're 80% you're of the course. way there. Um, and so it actually worked pretty well without many problems uh, right away. So yeah, I'd say uh, five or six of them have been contributed by other people. And I'm always uh, you know, open to considering more. So if there's a format that you want to support, then uh, by all means, uh, see if you can write a reader or a writer for it. Yes? Um, how often do you have to change the native uh, file format to support new other file formats for, for a reader or a writer? Um, yeah, so I've really been pretty conservative about that. And in some sense, the, the native format, the, the types of structures it supports, is kind of a least common denominator, right? So 
HTML is more expressive, LaTeX is way more expressive, DocBook is more expressive. Um, so if you convert a DocBook document to Pandoc and then convert it back to DocBook, you're probably going to lose a lot of information, right? Um, you won't get everything because Pandoc doesn't represent all the distinctions that DocBook does. Now, the least common denominator thing is good because it makes it much more feasible to write readers and writers for all these things, right? If we had everything represented, then you know, how, do you, how, do you, how do you output this in each format? Um, it just, it kind of, you know, every time you add something new to the type, I've got to go and update, you know, whatever, 15 writers and six readers or something like that to deal with that. And it's, you know, so it gets to be more work. Um, so I've been pretty conservative about adding things, but it's, there's always lots of discussion about whether things should be added. Um, uh, one of the big things that I think Pandoc is lacking right now as a tool for academic writing is a good way of uh, referring to and numbering automatically figures and things like that, which is something you can do very well in LaTeX. So I'd like to figure out how to design a good way to do that, but conceptually it's it's tricky to figure out exactly how to do it. Um, so that's something that could go in once we figure out how to do it. A better figure type is something that someone's working on right now. Um, anchors is another thing people have wanted. Uh, very common request going back years, which I still haven't done anything about, 